Shakti said, it's terrible to be able to see but to have no vision. Dear brothers and sisters, choose your vision, choose your dreams. Allah Iqbal, the poet of the East, he said something very wonderful. He said, the people who have no vision in their life are driven by the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the people who have a vision for their life become the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa And when a person, if you have no vision for your life, when you don't have a vision for your life, then definitely somebody else has. If you don't have a vision for your life, you don't have a plan for your life, then your neighbor has a plan for you, your parents have a plan for you, your relatives have a plan for you. Then whose life are you living? Are you living the life which you want to live? Are you living your dreams? Or are you living the life of your relative or your neighbor and what they want you to be? Or are you really the person that you aspire to be in your life? So my dear brothers and sisters, develop a goal and a vision for your life which will guide you for the rest of your life inshallah a dream and a vision by which you can abide and by which you can live i have to discuss with you i will discuss with you some of the ways to develop a vision or to help you in realizing your vision your dreams your goals in this brief time i will try to briefly cover the different aspects of vision and these different qualities which can help you inshallah to develop a vision for your life the first thing which I would like to discuss for an enlightened vision is optimism. Dear brothers and sisters, be positive in your life. Have an optimistic attitude towards life. And psychologically, those people who are optimistic about their life, who believe that they can do things, are much more happier than the ones who do. Sheikh Saadi is one of the poets. He writes, uh, in one of his books and the same uh, story has also been quoted by Dale Carnegie in one of his books. He says there were two people and both of them were in prison. Both of them looked outside the window. One saw mud, another saw stars. So my dear brothers and sisters, it's your perception. It's the way you look at life which really matters. And Islam always emphasizes optimism and Islam always tells you to be optimistic and positive towards your life. Islam tells you, Rusulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith that every good deed you do, you get 10 times the reward. So definitely Islam encourages you towards good. In the Quran, you see, the verse of the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, in the Quran, that with every hardship comes ease. And every hardship is followed by ease. Also, the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which emphasizes optimism, he said in the hadith of Sayyid Muslim, he said, Amazing is the state, amazing is the condition of a believer that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him, risk, gives him from his bounty, he does shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests a person, a believer, with trials and affliction, the person he does suffer. So in both cases, it's a win-win situation for a believer. So dear brothers and sisters, for a vision, optimism is very important. After optimism, number two is believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. All of you must be having some goals, some dream. Follow your heart and follow your dreams. Be confident. Believe in yourself that you can do certain things. Have a high amount of self-efficacy, which means that when you take a task, you should believe that you will be in charge able to complete it very well. Follow your heart. Do the things you are interested in. Do the things which you really, really love to do. And if you read the biographies of all the successful people, maybe scholars, philosophers, CEOs of different companies, what we find common in all of them is that all of them believe in their dreams. They believe in they achieve certain specific goals. So believing in yourself is very important. Be passionate and love what you do. Whatever it may be, whatever may be your interests, your hobbies, your activities, just love them the way they are and fall in love with whatever you do. And 
Thirdly, set up your goals and plans. This is very important. So you can make a list of your goals, make a list of your goals, make a list of your plans. Both of your short term and your long term goals. That what are you planning to do in the near future and what are you planning to do for your long term goals. You can make a list of your interests. Whatever you are interested in, whatever your hobbies are, whatever career you want to take, make a list of them. Make a list of the things that you want to do in your life. Then, some of the things will work for you in the future, others won't. So, then inshallah, slowly the list of your goals will get filtered. Ultimately, you will come up with what you want to do in your life, inshallah. Make goals, make your goals specific, like about your religion. Make specific goals about your family. For example, if in terms of religion, you can make a goal that in this month I want to memorize this much of the Quran. In this month I want to read this much of the books about the Quran and the Sunnah. Similarly, make goals about your family, about your relatives, that if you are living away from your family, that I will call my family back every week, etc. Things like that. Make goals like this, inshallah, and that will definitely help you in enlightening your vision. And planning for your life is really, very really important. That's why somebody said that if you are failing to plan, then you are planning to fail. And after setting up goals and plans, brothers and sisters, what is more important is the fourth point, which is taking an initiative. I'm very sure that many of you must have planned your goals and you have a lot of ideas. But initiation, initiating your goals, taking the initiative is very important. And let me give you my personal example. I was 17 years old and I wrote my first book on the true purpose of life. And at that time when I was 17, I wrote a book not because I was a scholar, there are many good scholars around, but I only finished to write a book and I managed to publish it one of the very good publishers in India just because I took the initiative at the proper time. How many of you have an idea but you fail to initiate anything and then you just ignore your inner self and you ignore your idea? Then one day years pass by and then you see other people doing what you had thought years ago and then you think, alas, if only I had done it before those years then I would be happy the one who initiated this idea. Years pass by, when you don't go upon your ideas, somebody else definitely does. So dear brothers and sisters, working upon your dreams, taking the initiative is definitely very, very important. Fifthly, the fifth principle towards a vision and success is to make right choices. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a blessing only to the human which is intellect, which is the power of choice. What makes human beings so superior to every other creation, including the angels? What makes us so superior, brothers and sisters? It is the power of choice which we have. So always try to make right choices for your life, whatever you are going to do. And remember, whatever you choose is going to decide how the rest of your life will be. Decide well, plan well for your life, for your career. And if you think you are studying something, you are in a career you are not really interested in, then brothers and sisters, remember, it's never too late to marry. I know a lot of brothers and sisters who are tangled up somewhere they don't really want to be. But I always tell them and I tell them and I am right now right here telling you that follow your heart, follow your dreams. Inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you success. Definitely. And about the power of choice, I remember once there was a wise old man and he had a grandson. So he is advising his grandson. He's advising him that my dear son, inside every human being, we have two wolves inside us. One, and both of these are raging against each other. Both of these wolves, they are fighting with each other. One of the wolves is envy, anger. It is hate for others, jealousy, backbiting. 
This is one of the four. And the other four is love, compassion, kindness, mercy, and so on. So the little son, he asks, which of the four things? The old man replied, the one you feel. SubhanAllah. So, if there is goodness in you, and you try to multiply it, inshallah, it will definitely it will come back to you because what goes around comes around. And the change which we are talking about here comes from within. It is more like an inclusive change. And the change starts from an individual level. It starts from several individuals like me and like you. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, in the 11th verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 13, Allah says that Allah never changes the condition of the people who don't change what is in their hearts. So it means until and unless you take the initiative to change yourself, to change the ways of your life from evil to goodness, nothing is going to change. So taking an initiative towards goodness, towards your success, towards your dreams is definitely very important. Afterwards, we come to the sixth point, which is ask for Allah's help. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, La taqratu min rahmatullah. Do not despair the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is listening. He is Samir. He is Basir. Allah listens to each one of you. And Allah's help is always there. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your guidance, for success. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Qur, chapter 11 of the Quran, verse 88, it's a dua. It says, I just seek, I just seek reform to the best of my power and help, Sa'ada, in this task can only come from Allah. In Him I trust unto Him I love. The verse of the last verse of Surah Al Qabul, chapter number 29, it says, Those of among you, of the believers, who strive, who struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will guide them in this path. Allah will definitely guide those who strive. And Allah will definitely guide those who ask and who turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Dear brothers and sisters, after Allah's help, Number seven is a very important point, is to choose the right company for yourself. Choosing right friends. Rasulullah said that a person is on the religion of his friend. Means, it's talking about his peer pressure, that the friends and how they can influence each other. In another hadith, Rasulullah said, he drew an analogy. He said, he gave an example that the person who sells oath or mist, the one who sells musk, if you go near him, some of it will affect you. Similarly, if there is an iron smith and you go to his shop, some of the sparks and some of the dirt will definitely affect you. So my dear brothers and sisters, choosing a right company is really very important because peer, peer pressure, the influence which one friend exerts on another is really of great importance. So choose the friends which will help you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The friends which will help you in realizing your vision of your life. The friends which will help you towards the progress in your being and towards the progress in your akhirah, inshaAllah. And that is how the Quran classifies the believers in Surah Taba, chapter number 9, verse number 71. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the believers men and women, they are the protectors of one another. They enjoy what is good and they forbid what is wrong. So the friends to each other should be the ones who remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who make your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more stronger than it was before. So dear brothers and sisters, choose your company very well. <laughs> Afterwards, we have an another very important issue which is about another point which we need to discuss towards developing a vision and success is about Muslim identity. Ya Salam, be proud and be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you to be the universe. 
I know brothers and sisters who accepted Islam, who learned to Islam, and how much struggles they did. Some of them had to leave their jobs, some had to leave their families, just because they embraced the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be helpful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are Muslims. Be proud of your Muslim identity. Because a very important issue is how and what we identify ourselves as. Who are our role models? Our role model is not Justin Bieber or Brad Pitt or Dr. Dre or 50 Cent. Our role model is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our role model are the Sahaba. Our role model is Abu Bakr and Umar and Usman and Ali and Talha and Zubair. May Allah be pleased with them all. Know your history. Know the roots you are coming from. Know the Islamic history. Know that what sacrifices our Islam, our Sahaba, Tabi'in and their students they made so that this deen and the message of Islam reaches to us. Know about your history. And what happens is that when we don't know the contribution of our Muslim scholars, when we don't know the contribution of our ulama, we get influenced by external elements. When someone doesn't know the own, our own history, then only we get influenced by the Western scholars, Western philosophers, and we say that wow, they are very great. This happens because when we haven't read our own history. If you read your own history, it will definitely develop a sense of identity in you, and you will definitely be proud that what our pious predecessors or Sultan Saladin have left behind for us. And that is the way which we have to adopt in order to again be successful in this world and the hereafter, inshallah. Number nine is that for a vision, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really very important. Trust in Allah. Tawakkul. Do tawakkul. Do the best you can and leave the church to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is the one who decides what the outcome is going to be and the what the results are going to, our actions are going to yield. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah mentioned in Surah Salah, chapter number 65. Allah says, those of you who put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will find Allah sufficient for them. Sufficient will be Allah for the ones who trust Him. Ya Salam, a hadith of Odyssey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in hadith of Odyssey, He says, I am to my slave. I am to my slave what He thinks of me. In other words, He says, I am to my believer, whatever he thinks of me, and I can do to my slave what he thinks I can do for him. So if you believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you more than your parents, Allah will love you more than your parents. If you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely forgive your sins. If you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter you into Jannah, He will never betray your trust in Him. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will enter you into Jannah. <laughs> so, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very really important. No matter what you do, no matter what activities you plan to do, in the end, the results are only up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The outcome is only rest in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, trust in Allah is very, really, very really important. The tenth and the most important point which I feel towards developing a vision in your life, towards having a focus in your life is to have hope. To have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have hope for your future. To have hope for your dreams. Many of us, brothers and sisters, how many of us here amongst us today feel that we are so sinful. We have done so many sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forgive us. But remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful to us. In a hadith, Rasulullah said, he said in a hadith of Tirmidhi, he said that if a person does the sins and his sins cover whole of the earth and then the sins rise out, till they cover whole of the heavens and the heavens and the earth are filled up with the sins of a single person. Trust me, none of us can do so many sins which can fill the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between. But the hadith says, even if a single person commits so many sins and he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for, for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely forgive his sins. Once, 
Rasulullah SAW gave it, it was something like a gathering or something like a festival. So the Sahaba and Rasulullah SAW are together. So they see a woman, she has lost her child in crowd, she lost her child somewhere. And she is looking for her and she is sad. And she finds her child at a distance, she goes to her child, embraces him and hugs him. And the Sahaba and Rasulullah SAW, they are watching this scene. And Rasulullah SAW said to the Sahaba, do you think that this loving mother can throw this child, which she loves so dearly, into fire? They said, no, how is this possible? The mother loves the child so much. Rasulullah SAW replied, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves each one of you much more than this. Mother loves her child. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very merciful. I would like to thank I would like to conclude my speech with a beautiful story. The story of one of the Imams of Hadith. The story of one of the greatest Mahathisim. His name was Malik ibn Dina. You know Malik ibn Dina? Yeah. He was the one who brought the message of Islam to this place. Do you know his story? Yeah. Malik ibn Dina writes his own story. What does he say? Listen to these brothers and sisters very carefully. Malik ibn Dina, he says, that I was a person who did every kind of sin. Whatever you can think of, any sin you can think of, I had already committed it. I murdered, I stole, I did zina, I drank khama, I did every type of maasiyah. He says, once I was walking by the road, I was passing by, and I saw a girl, which was around five years old, and when I saw that girl, I felt something in my heart. I went back home. I went back home. I started praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah, what is this? Why is this change of heart happening inside me? And suddenly he makes the decision, Malik bin Kumar makes the decision to get married. So he gets married and after nine months Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he bestows him the daughter for Fatima. Afterwards, once Malik bin Kumar is drinking wine, so he's drinking wine, so the Fatima comes up and she starts playing with his beer and puts his fingers into the wine and throws the glass away. Malik bin Kumar says, if it was somebody other than my daughter, my daughter Fatima, I would have stuck his neck. So, he just embraces the child and hugs and kisses her and he decides that he's going to drink wine. He's not going to drink wine again. Some years pass by, Fatima is getting older. She is getting older. And when she gets five years old, she, the Fatima reminds Malik bin Dinar of the child which she had seen on the street that day. But Malik bin Dinar says that time a great calamity befall on me. A very great calamity. Allah took my beloved daughter Fatima away from me. She died. And after she, Fatima died, Malik bin Dinar again started to pray. He used to be all the day and all the night long. He started again to do one, more and more. He says once during the day after he drank, he slept. Malik bin Dinar slept. And he had a vision. Now listen to this. He had a vision, he had a dream. He saw that it is the day of Qiyamah. It's the day of resurrection. People are being resurrected from their graves. And Malik bin Dinar also gets up from his grave. And he sees that a black, a huge serpent, a huge snake is chasing Malik bin Dinar. Wherever he goes, the snake follows him. Wherever he goes, the snake is riding. He wants to get rid of the snake, but he's not able to do so. So he runs away. Until finally, he finds an old man. An old man who is weak. So he goes to the old man. Malik bin Dinar says, please help me out. Please do something. This serpent is not leaving me. So he says, try to climb the top of the mountain. Maybe you will find something. So the Malik bin Dinar climbs the mountain, cliff, but still the serpent is following him. So he comes down back to the old man. Again asking for help. So he says, I'm too old. I'm feeble. I can't help you. Go in between the mountains. Maybe you'll find some shelter where the serpent leaves you. So while he's finding the shelter in the mountains, he sees his daughter Fatima at a distance. He goes running to Fatima. And he tells Fatima what's all this, what's happening around, what's going on. So the Fatima replies, the black serpent which is chasing you are your bad deeds. They are your bad deeds which you have done in your life. 
and the white old man, you saw the old man, the weak old man are your duties which have become so feeble, which have become so few and so weak that they cannot help you. And she recites, Fatima recites the verse from the Quran that has not yet the time come for the believers to submit themselves, humble themselves to your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After she recites the verse, Malik Mubila gets up from his sleep. And it's the time for Maghrib, Salah. So Malik bin Jinnah goes to pray Maghrib in the masjid. And coincidentally the Imam recites the same verse from the Quran that has not yet the time come for the believers to submit themselves, to humble themselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Malik bin Jinnah, he knew that this is the time to change. His world had been changed. And then, Afterwards, he became one of the greatest Imams of Ali and he narrated Ali from Anas bin Mali and from Ibn Sirih and then he used to shout in the middle of the night in the streets waking up people and telling them to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pray to Haji. and once what happens? Malik bin Dinar is inside his home now after all this he is praying to Haji, and the thief knows and the thief breaks into his house so, Malik bin Dinar catches him by his arm. So, when Malik bin Dinar goes into Ruku, he takes the thief into Ruku. When he goes into Saizda, he takes him in the Saizda. So, after they finish, after he finishes the Salah, he asks the thief, what do you want? So, the thief says, I came to steal in your house, but I don't want any infiltration. So, please, just let me go. Malik bin Dinar says, I promise you I will let you go. Just pray to the house of Salah with me. So, the thief prays to Ragas with Malik bin Dina. So now Malik bin Dina says, no, you are free. He says back, no, I want to pray two more. And two more. And two more. Until it's the Fajr. Time for Fajr. And they pray Fajr together in the Masjid. And after that, he says, no, you are free. You are a free man. You can go. And the thief says back, haven't you heard the Hadith of Muhammad Salaam in which he said, if a person tells you, that if a person wants to be your guest, you have to accommodate him for three days. SubhanAllah, even the three things about the honey. So, Malik bin Dinar says, come with me. So for three days, they are passing in the day and they are praying in the night, etc. After three days, this he gets back to his group, the group of the bandits. He gets back. So they tell him, you have been looking for three days. We have been looking for you. Did you have a big group or something? So he said, Yes, I had a big group, but somebody stole it from me. So they are like, who stole it from you? We are going to kill that man. So he said, no, no, he stole something which you cannot bring our back. He said, the thief says, I went to steal it from Malik bin Dina, but in turn, he was the one who stole my heart and he made me submissive before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And <laughs> lastly, I would like to conclude with this remark that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to this world and he fulfilled his mission. But Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fulfilled his mission, but he did not fulfill his mission. The vision of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was to see a ummah which is large in number. His vision was to see that Islam, to see Islam penetrating and reaching every house, every corner of the world. And we are the ones, this is the ummah who have to help in realizing the vision of the Muslim through our efforts, through our dharma, etc. The time is brief and I must continue. And this vision development and personality development, I do workshops like this and inshallah, I love this place. I really love to be here and inshallah. I hope to see you again very soon, inshallah. Thank you very much, all of you. Jazakumullah khair. Wa'afamu dawana and alhamdulillah.